Welcome to a breath of fresh air. Will we breathe fresh air again? I'm Martin Schroeder. I'm a professor of chemistry at the University of Manchester, and I'll be talking about our advanced porous materials that we use to clean up air. Peter is filming me, and we'll be putting in some graphics, but I think he may also put in a penguin on one shoulder and a puffin on another. We will see. The air that we breathe comprises 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, with only 0.03% carbon dioxide. So we all know that the levels of carbon dioxide are rising due to industrialization and energy demands. But in addition to carbon dioxide, we are producing ever more quantities of nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. This came to a head in 1952 when London suffered some very severe smogs and this led to a range of clean air acts that have been implemented ever since. Although visible smogs are less common, they still occur worldwide. And dangerous levels of nitrogen dioxide cause lung and heart disease. Indeed, the World Health Organization estimates that some 7 million people worldwide die every year from air pollution due to nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide and corresponding particulates. The source of the problem is combustion of fuel, of fuels, particularly fossil fuels, especially for transport, industry, electricity generation. And during the lockdown in May 2020 in the United Kingdom, 69% of the overall traffic was reduced, and this led to a 38% reduction in NO2, nitrogen dioxide, emissions, with a 17% drop in particulate matter. So we can reduce pollution. We can shift to renewable energy, wind, air, wave, and other renewables. We can make simple changes to our daily lifestyles, like cycling to work or simply flying less and using less energy. We can, of course, and will cut air pollution at source. But even with improvements, the quality of air in the United Kingdom continues to breach legal limits for nitrogen dioxide on a regular basis. So how do you catch the air? You can't grab it. A solid you can catch, like a ball, or you can pick an object up. Liquids you can pour from a bottle to a glass, or you can take a sponge, put it into water, and then transfer it, and squeeze the sponge, and the water falls into another vessel. There are materials that filter and purify liquid water, including rocks and clays, but air is more challenging. Vacuum cleaners and air conditioning units have filters, but these only take out large particles, such as hair, dust, and pollen. But these are millions of times bigger than the gaseous air pollutants that we're discussing here. So a little bit of mathematics. One picometer is equal to one times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So there are, there are tw 10 to the 12 picometers in a meter. So the size of carbon dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide is approximately 400 picometers. A virus such as COVID-19 is 300 times larger than that. And the cross section of a human hair or of a pollen particle is 250,000 times larger than that. So we can filter physically pollen, hair and dust, and even viruses, but gas is really much more challenging. Historically, there have been gas masks based upon activated charcoal and other such materials, activated carbons, that work, but they're not particularly efficient. We can take the air and cool it down and separate the components by liquefaction. 
So carbon dioxide, as you cool air down, solidifies at minus 57 degrees centigrade. Oxygen liquefies at minus 183 degrees centigrade, and nitrogen liquefies at minus 195 degrees. So these are very energy intensive processes and not really realistic. We really are not going to cool ourselves down to minus 195 degrees centigrade. So the problem is how do you capture a target molecule like nitrogen dioxide that is in low concentration overall in the air? What we have done in Manchester is develop a range of new materials called metal organic frameworks. And I have a model of one here. It is composed of metal ions bridged by organic ligands or organic molecules. And each organic molecule bridges to somewhere between four and six other metals. So typically, you end up with a cubic structure like this. It's a three-dimensional structure. You can see in this direction, I can view straight through. There's a channel here. Whereas if I rotate by 90 degrees, there is no channel. So this is a robust, highly stable material, but it is also highly porous. The dimension across this channel is around six to 700 picometers. So there's plenty of room for the gases to go in, to enter the pore, and there's also enough room to put chemical decoration to coordinate or bind to the pollutant gas. The pores are so narrow that overall, one teaspoon of this solid powder has an internal surface area the same as a football pitch. So these are extremely porous materials, some of the most porous materials known. And these act as molecular sponges, like the sponge in water, to soak up and trap gases. So we now have a very nice way of trapping pollutants like nitrogen dioxide. We now can take this within our pores and activate and transfer this to more benign materials. So we can introduce chemical centers, centers into our channels that will convert nitrogen dioxide to nitrogen. So therefore we have actually eradicated the pollutant. This has a lot of practical uses. Clearly, trapping nitrogen dioxide, it would be useful to trap it in a car or in your house or at work. But clearly, converting nitrogen dioxide to dinitrogen catalytically actually removes the pollution in, uh, completely. By chemically varying our material, we can also make changes to the structure, to the chemical functionality, so that we can now store at high capacity methane, we can separate hydrocarbons, we can store ammonia and hydrogen. Now hydrogen is very interesting because of course that could be used as a fuel to produce water. We already have battery-driven cars, that's using a different technology. But using hydrogen fuel cells is also an opportunity to develop clean technologies for transport. And many cities around the world already have hydrogen, uh, hydrogen vehicles with fuel cells driving them. Our porous materials in Manchester could be used to store the hydrogen, to deliver the hydrogen, to transport it, and molecules such as ammonia are also interesting because hydrogen can be generated from ammonia at the place of use. So therefore, ammonia is essentially a chemical portal for hydrogen. So we have some really interesting results. There are still many challenges to overcome. Large-scale production of our materials, integration into, de into devices, pelletizing them, delivering them to the marketplace so that they can be used practically. So this brings me back to the original question. Will we breathe fresh air again? Of course we will. Science, engineering, life and social sciences and medicine have delivered the important vaccines for COVID-19. This was a remarkable achievement 
that was delivered in the face of a huge challenge. The challenges of climate crisis, of pollution, which is the subject of today, and global warming are all solvable if we are brave enough to deliver the science, engineering and technology to solve those problems. Yes, we will breathe fresh air again, but we all need to work in our own ways, changing our lifestyle, developing new processes, new technologies, and surely, yes, we will all be breathing fresh air again. Thank you.